Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you really for joining the webinar and showing the interest to find more information and to learn something new about the large carnivores and about our work in Una National Park in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna announce start to share my screen so we can start the webinar. So for all of you who may not know about the geography of Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's one small country located in the Balkan Peninsula of Europe. Here you can see the red dot, that's Bosnia and Herzegovina, near Italy. The capital of the Bosnia and Herzegovina is Sarajevo. And Sarajevo is famous really because the 1984 Winter Olympics Games were held. And also one interesting fact about the Sarajevo is that Sarajevo took the key role in the outbreak of the World War I in 1878, and it was ruled, the entire country was ruled by the Ottoman Empire from the 15th century. But, and the Bosnia Herzegovina, regarding its nature, has a large rolling mountainous terrain. Uh, about two fifths of the country is hard to define, be it or not. And that's the reason why we have so rich wildlife that you're about to see. Let's, let me tell you something about the UNE National Park and what we, uh, what we do in UNE National Park. It's the youngest park, national park of the four national parks that we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was established in 2008. And the main attraction of this park, as you can see here, is the River Una. And that Una means one and only. It was given name by Romans who consider it to be the most beautiful river in the Roman Empire. And you should bet, if you ever come to Boston, you should bet to go to the National Park and visit the Stabatsky Waterfall. It's one of the biggest waterfalls in Boston and Herzegovina and in the, this part of Europe. It's, it is about 22 meters tall. And it's the main attraction here in the National Park. Here, here are some few photos. You can see the beauty of the waterfalls and the beauty of the river Una itself. It has the emerald green color, which is one of the most beautiful colors that you can see on the river. And here is the here is the other waterfall. It's near the Stepatsky waterfall. It's 10 meters high, and it's uh, also one of the most beautiful tourist attractions here in Una National Park. Here is the on a river and Stravatsky pool during the winter times. Here you can see the emerald green color that I was talking about. It's really amazing. Let me tell you something about the about the National Park and its mammals and fish, uh, birds, and Large carnivores. So in Una National Park, we have more than 100 bird species, about 30 species of fish. We have uh, like fish like uh, trout, and from the mammals, we have the lynxes, the wolves, and the bears that I'm going to hear about in a few slides. And the park protects and preserves various features from the extraordinary flora and fauna that we have for riverbank woodlands in the waterfalls, as you can see, with cultural and archaeological sites. Here you can see the next, okay, here are some few mammals. This is the roe deer. This is the wild boar. They're all present in the national park in large numbers. Here you can see the wolf. This is from our trail camera for, for capturing the wildlife. Here you can see the red, the red fox. And here is one medieval city from, from the Ottoman Empire. It's one of the main attractions here in Una National Park. It's called the Ostrich Castle. Now we're going to talk something about the Mount Kraševica. 
is the other aspect of how we work. We work with large carnivores in Mount Gashevitsa and also in Munda National Park. So the Mount Gashevitsa is a natural gem that impresses with its length, with its height, and it belongs to the zone of the Dinaris. It's a rocky mountain system. I mean, the, we have a mountain that stretches across two countries in Bosnia and in neighboring Croatia. So we have two peaks. The highest peak of our mountain is called Srnibr, meaning the Black Peak. It's about 1,562 meters tall. It is in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the other is in Croatia, which is 1,557 meters. Here, here is the bottom of the top. This is the peak from the Bosnian side. And also the Dashevitsa mountain is rich in various karst forms like pits, like abysses, like caves. Here is one photo where you can see the den of a bear because the bears, they like to spend the winter in the, this kind of dens. Even though they can spend the winter under a fallen tree, but they like to go inside these rocky dens. So Dashevitsa, like all other mountains, it belongs to the Dinaric system, and that meaning that the Dashevitsa mountain is really scarce in water, and it was built mostly of these permeable limestones, and therefore, as I said, it's very scarce in water. We can see the water pool. And forests. They are, they are our, the most beautiful parts in the Mount Gashevitsa. We have a lot of forests, a lot of, of habitats for large carnivores, like this one. Forest richness is the main characteristic of the mountain, and it's really almost uh, the greatest value, which occupies 85% of the massive itself. So, as you can see here, this is the beach beach forests, the rocky beach forest, it provides a lot of food when it seeds the large carnivores, especially the bears. And as, uh, except the Bagusabatka, the common beach, we have the fir and we have the spruce forest that also provides uh, a lot of shelter to the wildlife. Here you can see some photos of the beach forests. It's very important for the large carnivores, especially the bears and the wolves, to have area where they can hide themselves during the denning periods and during the mating season. Regarding the flora of the national of Mount Gashevitsa, we have species like oaks, like pines and like corn beams and maples. So we are very, very rich in biodiversity. The entire Bosnia and Herzegovina is really rich country in biodiversity. We have a large number of fauna and flora in our country. The most uh, mammals that we have in Gashevitsa are and Bosnia and Herzegovina are brown bear, red wolf. They represent the large carnivores and they are extremely important. They are so-called leading umbrella species that crucially affect the health, the structure, and the balance of ecosystems. It's strong power to improve habitats and increase the populations of many species in them. In Europe, you have five species of large carnivores, and three of them are living in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Those are the bear, brown bear, the gray wolf, and you have the Eurasian lynx, and you have the wild cats. So those are like the top large carnivores that depend sparse of Bosnia and Herzegovina. All of the large carnivores represents also the European Union rare and endangered species by Natura, Natura 2000 important species, and they are also on IUSN red list of endangered species, which is really important for the conservation. Uh, other mammals that are 
present phenomenon attached to its uh, here you can see the red fox, the roe deer, the white marten, and you can see the boars, wild boar. They present, they're present in a large numbers in Mount Dashivitsa, and they're approaching settlements, as you may know, where they can find a lot of food, like uh, potato, plantations of potato, potato, they really like to eat that. And so it's really, they're really, they're really a major problem for a lot of farmers because of that. And they're really mobile. They can have a litter between one to six piglets. So they use really large numbers and represent a huge problem for local farmers. Here are some photos of the wild boar with its piglets. Here's also one interesting animal. It's honey badger. Here you can see one bit of the world bee. And you will be able to see that the deer notices the camera and he is looking straight straight to the camera. It's really funny. Here you can see how he notices the cameraman. So the deers, they have really great hearing. They can hear really good. Okay, let's move on. Regarding the order of the of Dashevitsa, we have birds like eagles, like falcons, which are endangered species. And we have the family of hawks and also the owls, as you can see here. And we also have one of my favorite animals in Mount Dashevitsa which is high, highly endangered species, is the Cape Western Cape Kelly, like this one. You will see a better photo right soon. And we also have like Pong Fuku, it's a really amazing bird. And we have also endangered migratory birds that have returned here in Dashavitsa after the war, which happened 25 years ago, like the starlings and like the sallow. Here you can see the Western Cape of Kelly is in the chicken family. It's our native species. And you will have you can see here the non-native species. This is about common pheasant. He is native to Asia. So we have really numerous and diverse according to fauna questions. Let's talk something about their large hunters. So the European Union, as I said, is home to five species of large hunters. And we, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have three of them. We don't have the wolverine, and we don't have the Iberian lynx. He's native to the Spain and Portugal. We have the gray wolf, we have the brown bear, and we have the Eurasian lynx, lynx and the lynx, which is the most endangered species of the group. Large carnivores, they're predators, and they are therefore at the top of the top of the food pyramids. They are so-called the apex predators, and thus they, thus they play a crucially regulatory role over unrelated population, like uh, roe deer, like the wild boar, the red deer. So they just like to control the populations of the roe deer species. Let's say if there are no large carnivore presence in a forest, the population of, uh, let's say, roe deer would increase, and the uh, seedlings of a forest species would die because the red deer and the roe deer, they're feeding on the small uh, each seedlings. They're feeding on the seed, they're feeding on the buds of the tree, and they are stopping the forest from regeneration. That is one reason why having large carnivores like bear and the wolves is important in a forest habitats. And also some large carnivores like wolverine, which we don't have here, they are also scavengers and they're really important in ecosystems because they play a cemetery role by feeding on the dead animals and they are, they are preventing the diseases from spreading because their stomach and the acid in their stomach is 
really strong and it's helping them to digest the carcass and the bacteria that is found with the carcass or dead animal. And and said that they are really important for us humans because we are not getting sick because the scavengers are playing their role in ecosystems. Also, like the bears, what is the bear important? It's the step of the other role that they have in ecosystems through the uh, bear diets. Bear, bear, uh, he helps to disperse seeds and across the forests, enhancing and enriching the vegetation structure and diversity in the given ecosystems. Because some seeds they need to pass throughout a digestive system of the bear in order to germinate in the forest. So the bears are important to that also. Also large carnivores can also bring benefits to a lot of communities, especially in cases where they have had the opportunity and desire to join with the public authorities and large firewalls experts like we are to develop a common management plan. Also having a large converse in a forest is also important for tourism as we can let's say label agricultural products thus triggering a new stream of visitors, wildlife creatures and consumers. So that's really important but say we, you can label a honey, you can label like a jam, a marmalade, everything because of the large carnivores. Here's my friend, he's exploring the den of the bear, and you will be able to hear something about that in later slides. This is one of the most dangerous things that you can do while researching bears. Okay. Just a few information about the species of the bears. You have about eight species of bear throughout the world. American black bear, European and European brown bear, that is the most widespread species of the brown bear. Here's the ma maps of distribution. As you can see, the brown bear here is the most widespread bear of them all and has many subspecies. Here in Antarctica, here is the polar bear, he's the mammal bear. He lives and feeds. As I said, the brown bear is the most widely distributed of all bears, and it's widespread in the forests and mountains of North America, Europe, and Asia. And it has a number of subspecies. We can say in Balkans, there is the Eurasian brown bear, Subspecies, Eucustus arctus arctus. And except the Eurasian brown bear, we have Odiel bear. He is the largest of the brown bear subspecies. And we have also the famous grizzly bear, which is native to the United States. And if you didn't know, the smallest subspecies of the brown bear is a Syrian brown bear, and he has a whitish fur. Not brown like this one, and he's native to Turkey, Afghanistan, and Azerbaijan, and uh, maybe Georgia. Let's say something about the biology, quality, and behavior of the brown bear, and then we're going to go and see what do we do in, in the national park. So, brown bear is the largest carnivore species, and the only species bear species in countries of the EU and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is not in the EU, and he, he belongs to the binary Indus population. We have many populations of brown bear, as you could see on the map, and the brown bear that we are researching in the National Park represents his belonging to the binary Indus population. So he is like uh, 2.2 meters tall, and he can weigh up to 350 kilos. I would say the grizzly bear, and he can weigh up to 550 kilos. So brown bear somewhere in the middle. Here are the map of the populations of the brown bear. This is the map of Europe, 
and here are the cosines going at here, and we have the generic windows population around here. You can see many other populations across the world, from Spain, Iberian population to the Russia and to the Scandinavian population. So you have a lot of subspecies of ground bear. What does the bear eat? Here you can see some photos of the plants. Bears, they are omnivorous species, meaning they like to feed on the seeds and nuts of the roots, of the grass, insects, and sometimes wild ungulates like the deer like the roe deer, like the wild boar. And the spring is the most challenging season, especially until the beginning of the growing season. And during that time, bear likes to attack, as I said, uh, red deer, especially when the snow is high, because they're red deer and for the brown or the roe deer, they're having trouble to walk. If the snow is high and bear can easily catch it without spending too much energy. And that is the, something that bear loves to do. And also bear also can feed on anthropogenic food like garbage, like domestic animals and crops also. And when available and unprotected. But you should never feed the bear. You have to remember that never feed the bear. Here you can see like the oaks, uh, the wild fur, the beef nuts, the wild strawberry, and the uh, blueberries, and the cranberry also. But here, all of these photos are taken from our trail cameras that were attached to the trees for a few of these amazing animals. Here you can see the ponds, which is man-made for the bears to swim and to drink water during the hot summer days. You can see like four of the bears. We have maybe 25 to 30 bears or more even in the mountains. Here's one bear chilling in the ponds. He's just relaxing and enjoying. You can see it's like 12 degrees Celsius. So for him, it's like Here you can see a bear with its cups feeding. Also one bear just passing by. And you can see now the, the snow activity, the winter activities of the brown bear. bears they start mating when they are three to five years old and they bring uh, one to four cups of worlds they're born during the mating period around january they're blind toothless hairless and they and they weigh less than 500 grams so they really they are really depending on their mother and bears are really protective and really aggressive while having cups so we never approach see any bear cub wandering around, maybe you can think that the cub is alone, abandoned, it's not. The mother is always nearby, so you should never approach the bear cub, you should always back and leave as soon as possible. Uh, as I said, we are with the forest richness in Bosnia, it's really important for the bears, because bears, they need places in which they can take cover, and with, where they can have a sufficient number of caves of the human reach to hide and to give birth to a bear cubs. 
So that's really important for them. And they can find all that in the course. And we have a lot of tools reserved for us that are crucial for the players to drive and to live the best quality life. The players, they're generally shy and they typically avoid people. That is something you have to remember when you're going in the course to take a to hike or to just walk with your friends. The players have really good hearing. They're, they're going to hear you way before you notice the bear. So you never should, you should never run when you encounter a bear. Just back off slowly and the bear will go in its own way. But never, you should never, uh, you see a bear, never approach, as I said, the cubs. Because the bear will only attack human if the bear is surprised or when the bear is protecting their cubs. In all of the way, where they will just leave and you won't have problems. And the bear smell, sense of smell, as I said, is about 100 times better than humans. So it can, it can feel you, it can sense you, your presence, way more than you can notice the bear. And it's gonna leave. So I like to say it's really privileged to see a bear or even a bull in the forest. So you have to be really lucky to see a bear in the forest, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the bears, they don't usually tend to, they don't usually have to spend the winter in the tents, in the rocky tents. They can sleep like this one, under, let's say under a fallen tree, in an open nest, under a cliff. So they can just hide in a tent with vegetation. And spending winter in a tent is probably an adjustment to lack of food during winter time and possibly also giving birth to cubs which are not capable of thermoregulation like the grown bears. Also, some bears they may stay active all winter. They don't usually need to go and hibernate in the in the den. And as you may know or may not know, bears can sleep 100 days without eating, without drinking, without producing waste. That's really interesting. And also, the bears, they can, let's say, what, what they can do when they're sleeping. They can turn their own pee into the protein, and thus they don't have to, to put the pee outside of the body. So that's really important for them to survive the winter. They can make protein while sleeping. This is the bears, they can live up to 30 years. They can reach the age of 20 to 30 years and the average life expectation is however only six years. And many animals die of uh, under nourishment or disease. And all the bears in Europe are protected by law. You have these agreements like Bern Conventions, like the Washington Conventions, and also the EC Council Directive that all protects the bears. They also apply in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as I said. But my friends, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you have a part of the country that has protected the bears and other part of the country that hasn't protected the bears. So we really messed up with that. We should follow the EU directives, and I hope we will in the near future. Here is some for sure about how to behave in bear areas. I can provide a link to this brochure for everyone that is interested. It's really important to know all this stuff when you go hiking in forests. Okay, let's move now on what do we do in the National Park and Mount Dash. 
Pune National Park with collaboration with the partners. For the last 10 years, we have been exploring the life of large animals like bears, wolves, and lynx. And how do we do that? We are using the telemetry technology, like this uh, collar. We are using the trail cameras, and we are using the non-invasive genetic sampling uh, to study the lives of large carnivores. And those data that we obtain help us to better manage the populations of these species, both in protected areas and beyond. And while taking a walk in the National Park, you can, you can see a lot of these signs there on the roads. And we have, you can see, we have a lot of these signs like wolves and wolves on the roads. They're really interesting. And many people do take photos of these signs while we're in Duna National Park. So in 2012, we started the project Wilderness and Wildlife of the Duna National Park. And the first animal to be studied was a bear. So this pro the project envisions the preparation of a study of the coexistence of animal cocoons and provided answer to possible pressures on the environment and endangered species, as well as measures for the protection and restoration of species. So the bear catching action began in the fall 2012, by turning the terrain and looking for the best location to set these trail cameras, as you can see here in the tree. And our best, uh, what, what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve to catch a bear in a harmless and safe way. And this was the first time that such kind of project started in our area in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And back then, no one ever succeeded in catching a live bear and then releasing it on par. So the bear is really an intelligent cocoonist, which is difficult to track down across in inaccessible terrain and trucks. Here you can see my friend set the trap. It's humane trap, it doesn't even hurt the bear. And here is the trap bear you can see it one, two, three, four, five. It's similar to human books. What do we do first? We first place foods in selected places to lure the bear to the trap, like fish, like dead domestic animals. We set the trail cameras that react to changes in temperature and movement with which we need to monitor the movement of the animal. And the bears were approaching the place where the traps were and they sniffed the base setting. But the bear did not choose the touches. That was like a really shocking situation for us when we tried to catch our first bear. And after reviewing the cameras, like my friend is doing here, and shot the first bait, and we decided on which location to set the trap again. And this time we had more luck because we caught the first bear. And you'll see. Uh, what do we do after that? Here is how the traps, how the trap is looking, is looking. It's just a steel cable in the bear foot, foot here. It just stretches across the across its foot and he is then caught and very angry. Here are you can see the drugs that you have to put in a dark gun in order to sedate the bear so we can take all the measurements in this. Here is the camouflage trap. We have really put a lot of fallen leaves, a lot of rocks to look as much as possible for bears not to see it. Here is what we do next. You have to put the drugs in a tar again and you have to sedate the bear. This is the telemetric color that we can track there. 
when we when we release. Here is the my friend taking the telemetry color on the bear's neck. And you can check the bear. We mostly check it for like one year, 12 months. And this is the telemetric color. This color was sending a GPS VHF signal for two years, which are our first bear, the name Dukic, and the color he was wearing fell of the neck with the help of the job of that method, because every every one of these colors they're equipped with the drop of acid, so we do not lose the water in the wilds. And the bear, which was named Dukic, uh, he was he has continued to live his life without these so-called ornaments. He wore for two years of for scientific research. So face to face with the king of the forest, as we like to say, uh, it's a really big responsibility when you're getting ready to catch an animal in the shop because you have to spend as little time as possible to sedate it, to process it so it doesn't get hurt because we don't want the bear to get hurt and we don't want us to get hurt. So when you're preparing the drugs in the dark gun, you have to, re you have to be really experienced that's to just see the weight of the bear. So if you put too much drugs in Dargan, you can kill a bear. If you put too little drugs in Dargan, the bear can wake up suddenly and he can like kill you in a few moments. Like this one bear, you, you can see he just jumped on our car and he just he started to smash the hood of the car. It was really intense moment, and we were really scared when this happens. So we named that bear Dukic, as I said, after the locations where we lured him to chat. But also because when he woke up, he was really angry, as all bears do, because they don't like to get desedated. Uh, this bear Yukuch, he weighed almost 200 kilograms and he was 200 centimeters long, which was 50% more than the average specimen in Croatia. He had a pronounced hump on the back, characteristic for all of the bears. Clothes, they were 5.2 centimeters long and was in excellent health. And after we put the chip under the key skin for the identification, movement, and lifestyle of the bear, we monitor the bear for 24 hours and then we let the bear go and we track him by GPS via satellite where his position is determined every two hours. And also, in case the bear was shot, we would know that because colors have a built in hard grade monitoring mode really important because the bears can be killed in illegal hands. It's how it looks when you get satellite data of, of, of the bear movements. Here are some facts about the bear usage. He stayed at a total of 478 locations for a shorter or longer period. And during the monitoring period, he span the Una River five times because he had a girlfriend in the other side of Croatia. And he was really happy because of that. He used to swim the Una River, as I said, five times just to meet with her girlfriends, with his girlfriends. And he, say, he stayed in Boston at 330 locations, and in 165 locations, he was in Croatia and moved in area more than 400 kilometers square. And he also became the father of female cubs, contributing to the prolongation of the species and enriching the number of large carnivores in the Uni National Park. Here's some photos of the den of the bear village. It was in the shape of the letter S, about 50 meters long, 
and consisted of a primary and secondary tag. In it, we found fresh threads and rules that the bear wrote inside its mouth, perhaps like for fear. And also, such location for the bear is then can be included in the risk also, but in a safe way. You have really be really careful when, when entering the bear then. Here is my friend here, as you can see, he is just taking the measurements of the dead photos for research. Here is how it looks from inside, from outside. So some bands are so old, there is interesting data about that, and still in use by bears that scientists have found the bones of ancient cave bears in them, which became extinct like more than 10,000 years ago, which is really amazing. And it's what is also interesting for bears, that the same bears, same individuals, they never hibernate in the same den, and it's always, they are always looking for a new location. So when measuring the den, we have to make a sketch of the den, we have to photograph the inside of the den and the area around the den. And of course, if you find it, we have to take the biolog biological samples for genetic analysis, which is a common scientific practice when visiting the den. Here is the, our other bear, it was named Book. He's the second bear that we caught. He was caught in 2014 and, and marked with the GPS color. We took all the necessary measurements, like with the first bear. We took the samples for various analyses that are common in this scientific research, and we tracked this bear for 11 months. And he weighed like 260 kilograms, more than very much. Here are some photos. In Ulm National Park, we have marked so far six bears. Luch was the first one, Book was the second one, Pasha was the third one. And the most interesting for me was the bear units, which we caught and marked with the GPS color in 2019. And we followed, we have been tracking this bear for two years. Here's the, here is the bear in the wild. You can see here is wearing the telemetric GPS collar. Those few, this photo, uh, this photo is just a few days ago. Here is the area of the bear's den. Here is the entrance of the bear's den. You can see it's really rocky. Here is the inside of the bear's den. And here is our fifth bear that we caught at June 26 of 2019. We caught another, another male bear, and it was named Dermich after the mountain in Bosnia. And with these activities and projects, we show improve the rating and capacities of the Union National Park, like research of species and habitats, and through the, the development of tourism as a secondary activity in our work, which is really important. Okay. 
please run the show. It is the fear to me during the nights. This is the video from the trio camera. Because in this color, a mob function appeared in November 2019 due to which satellite that the data stopped coming and we lost the tracking of the bear. So we just could be able to visit the bear step. Here's our last bear that we caught. In 2020, it was named Ranger, and it was our sixth bear. He was eight to 10 years old. And after he was successfully sedated, we took the body measurements. As you can see, he weighed 220 kilos. And after he woke up from his sleep, he recovered really quickly. And he wandered into the depths and peace of the forests. And I'm going to show you some interesting videos later and about this bear. What do we do? How do we set a bear trap? Here you can see some photos. How do we set a bear trap? The most common bear trap is this the object, object hoof snare with its print activated trigger. It provides a safe and effective capture method for bears in a variety of field conditions. And what, what do we have to do? We have to just the most important thing is to camouflage the trap well so the bear is not fancy. As the bear has really good sense of smell, it can smell everything that is not like natural 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 in the habitat. So if you leave any smell behind you, bear can easily smell your presence and he will never step in the trap and be very, very delicate man. And you have to be really careful in these traps. Here are me and my friends getting trap last last year. There's a little bit of video that sh this video shows how to prepare a hole for the chat. It must be not too deep, just approximately the size of the bear foot. You put the steel cable across the wall. We'll see in the next video. This is the second trap that we placed. We placed three traps. And after three days, the bear was caught. So we have we waited only for three days, and the last bear was the fastest bear that we caught. We caught them 
like only in three days he was cool. So that was really like amazing for us. I guess we set the trap the best way possible. You really have to inspect these traps carefully, not to make any wrong move. Because if you do, you will never catch a fear. Step by step, you have to follow a guide or a textbook to do everything as good as possible. So here are the feeding stations for the bears. There are places in a forest at which food is provided to attract wildlife or observation or study. We place the tree of cameras. We bring the pool of apples, like parts of pets, as animals. And then we can take a photo of bears to study, to learn more about the behavior of the bears. Bears, they like the food that is really easy to find. As long as the easy food uh, is available, bears will incorporate the heat into the diets. Because they're like So during the winter times, we have to bring the food inside the hunting ground because the animals, they tolerate cold much more easier than hunger. So it's necessary for us to bring food feeding stations during the autumn, during the fall, before the first days of winter. And winter feeding of wildlife is very important for keeping the animal organism in the best possible condition, especially when females are preparing to perform for spring. Here you can see the dead pig, the poor, and the dead cow that was, I guess, Built by a car, and we brought it here to the feeding stations. So, how do we recognize the signs of a brown bear? We have bear tracks, we have scats of a bear, and rubbing trees. So, bears sometimes use trees as some kind of message. They usually choose the big Conifers trees, like spruces or firs, near paths or feeding grounds. So they bite, they scrape, or rub and get them. As you can see, these pictures, and they, they can totally destroy the bark of the tree. And for the bear's cats, we can learn much. These cats what varies in size, and in this cat, we can find a lot about their scouts and about their diets. Here is one example of bear scats. You here you can see the bear was eating, let's say, on beef seeds. If bear is if bear was feeding, or let's say. That animal, like wild boar, you will find a lot of bears in the pets in the bear. So, how do we check the bears? We are using the radio telemetry because that is the best method for studying bear movements. The bear is immobilized and a collar with a GPS transmitter is put on him. And those of that color regularly connects to the GPS satellite signal and calculates the exact location of the bear and sends all that data to us. And the metrically collected data, they provide us important information to help us better understand the behavior of the bears living in the project area, as well as monitor the effectiveness of the project activities. So genetic sampling, as I was saying, 
we can get a lot of important information from the ground bear species. So we can read animal genotype from feces samples as a kind of genetic inference. So when, when we collect these genetic samples, feces samples, we are doing that in the field when the bears are bears are preparing for hibernation because that is when the most fresh species are available for genetic analysis. And we do not collect the old species, we only collect the species that is five days old at the most. Here are some preparations. Now you can see uh, how do we prepare to catch when the bear is caught, what do we do next? Here you can see two veterinarians. That's they're preparing to sedate the bear. So they're choosing the right, right, right drugs to put in the dark gun so they can sedate the bear in the proper way. These are photos from the last year, from the, our last year. Here is the dark gun. It's just one type of an air gun that is used to sedate the bear. So after the bear is sedated, we are taking all of the necessary measurements. We have to take the size of its body, the length. Uh, we have to weigh the bear. You, you have to check the teeth of the bear. You have to, the, to check the sex of the bear and so on. This was the man, the male bear. Here we sports, he became very angry and he's trying to set himself free. So he is just biting everything around himself. Even he can bite the steel teeth, so that's the reason to see the bloody mix bears. Because this bear he was biting steel cable when he was caught, he, he injured himself just a little bit. It wasn't in his I'm gonna now play with the video where you can see how to sedate the bear. So you have to be real careful. You have to throw the bear inside the car, do it as fast as possible. You have to wait until the bear is calm down, then you can take a shot. As you, as you can see, the bear is really angry. You can see there is, there is a close up. You can see now in the better view, just a minute. Thank <laughs> you. 
See. Okay, here is the right one. I'm sorry. And when you do that, you have to be really fast in returning to the save. Okay, I'm going to just, because we are running out of time, I'm going to just show you that we are just researching the wolves also. We start a new project in Luna National Park here in this fall. And except wolves, we are also both researching the lynxes, the most invasive cats in Europe. Here is the European lynxes. European lynx, lynx, lynx. He is the most endangered cat in Europe. We are just also researching him as a large carnivore kind of with bears and with wolves. And like the bear, the lynx, and the wolves, they're also protected by wolves in Europe. These, were, these are my friends just taking the rounds of step of trap for a place. Okay. Thank you really for the attention and for listening to the webinar. I'm really happy to have you all here and thank you all. I'm going to now let the Liza do the talk and for all the questions that you may have to be asked. And I'm really sorry I didn't have more time to, to talk about the lists that works. Thank you, Mir. Um, that was lovely, lovely field trip of the Northwest region of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and, and thank you for sharing your work. And since we have a small group today, um, if you're comfortable turning on your video, uh, please, uh, we welcome you to turn it on and say hello. And we are open for questions. Um, if there's any questions for Emir and his work, um, it's pretty exciting. And I'm going to ask my first question. I'll just start it off with, um, what are some of the major and main challenges to the habitat in um, the Una National Park um, and the surrounding area. We have the, the habitat that the bears and other large animals live in. It's uh, really well uh, protected and it's really rich in biodiversity. And the only problems that we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina is the poaching or the illegal hunt. That's like the, that, that are the most uh, trackable for the bears. The traps are killed because the bears are killed illegally from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And for other mammals, the situation is the same. But as I said, the bears, they are protected by law and you cannot go legally to kill the bear because he's protected. By law, so that's it. Perfect, thank you. I see we have Sheila on the line. Hi, Sheila. Can you 
you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah thanks, Samir. That was very interesting. I I have the had the pleasure of being in Unan National Park, and it's just one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. And I I've always thought that once people learn that, that it's going to be uh, very well visited um, by folks from the U.S. Um, I'm just curious about, you know, the you're right on the border there with Croatia. Do you have cooperation that allows the, or, or, or do you work with them at all to kind of track the movement of um, different species over the border or any problems with that? We are, uh, we cooperate with the uh, national parks in Croatia also, uh, especially when we were researching, when we, when we were capturing the first bear, uh, like in 2012, we were uh, cooperating with the national park in Croatia, the Crypto National Park. It's also one of the amazing parks. And can you just repeat again? Um, yeah, just if you have any, um, if you track the migration of animals across the, the, the borders, because I, you know, I, I know that Croatia is part of the European Union and, and you, you have these, these challenges also with uh, people being in the forest and uh, unfortunately got refugees also moving through the area. So um, you know, what's, what, you know, what's the ability for the, uh, the animals to kind of move and, and do you see where they're going? For now, we are only tracking the pairs, the pairs, and we're now starting the wolf project, but before uh, the pairs, we haven't tracked any, any other animals. We only tracked six pairs, and since the Bosnian Herzegovina is not in the EU, we are not cooperating with other countries except with the Croatia because the, the bears from Bosnia they like to go, let's say, to the Croatia across the border, across the river Puma, uh, to meet with other bears from Croatia and then they return back to the Bosnia because the river Puma, as you could see in the video, is the border between Croatia and between Bosnia. And the bears from Boston, they are going, they, they're going to the river across to the to the creation sites. And we have been, we have been, and we are still doing that. We're monitoring the bears across the from nature colors and their behavior, their way of life, and where do they go? When do they spend the winter times? When do they return to the outside? And those are the data that we have so far. Only with the bears, and I hope we're going to have the data also with the wolves because we're now in the process of starting a wolf project in the past few weeks. We're going to check the relations of the gray wolves. In the All right, thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Emir, in your bio, that you we sent out f with this invitation. You work for both an NGO as an ecology educator, and yeah, also sure. with um, as a wildlife researcher here in Una. So can you just uh, let us know a little bit about what you do um, in both roles? In Center for Sustainable Development, I'm a quality educator. We are running projects about ecology, about the uh, about the nature protection, and about the urban culture also, and about the parks. So I teach to students and to all of our attendees the value of healthy and healthy and well-managed ecosystem, especially in urban forests, in parks, and also in the natural forests that we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I teach them how to how to recognize recognize, identify the trees, how to tell between the other types of trees, 
also a teacher in the public life life. And in Una National Park, I started recently, like a year or two years ago, with these wildlife projects. I uh, first bear that I thought was to be a ranger before the like, last year. I was involved in that action, and that was the first experience for me to see uh, a bear in person. Especially when he was caught, he was very angry, and that was like the amazing scene for me to just see all that. And I'm hoping that I'm going to get a lot of new experience with folks and with the other bears that we're going to track right now. But we are supposed to be this project to capture, to catch another bear that we're going to also mark with the GPS. Liza? Yes, please, Sheila. I've been trying to put a photo in the chat, but I can't figure out how to do it. So may I share my screen? I I want to show you a bear, a bear an angry bear that um, was in Una National Park and what they did to one of the vehicles there. Um, yeah, I just made you a co-host. Okay, okay, let me try. So I will share this with you, Amir, maybe you've seen it before. <laughs> but up here, this was a brand new vehicle and, and the bear took off all the paint up here and then <laughs> bit the front of the, of the, so your bears are um, active, let's say. We have also a video about that, what happened with that red car. Available <laughs> online, you can it was a great documentary and you see that it was, I think, the, the bear that was caught like, I think, maybe two years ago. And he did a lot of damage to that suit with his sharp claws. Really, it was really a sightseeing for all of the people who were there to see the strengths of the bear. Not also, to be underestimated, for sure. <laughs> That actually leads me to this other question that I had. So you're from the city of Bihar, um, did I pronounce that? Okay. And I was wondering, what do the citizens think of the wildlife? Um, and are they going out to nature a lot? Are they going out to the park knowing they're going to, they may be encountering a lot of these large carnivores? Especially because the city of Bihar is really popular for its tourist destination because of the mountain passages. There is a lot of hikers, a lot of my friends are hikers. They like to go in the mountain to hike to spend the time with their friends. And they know that Tashkent is really famous for having a lot of bears. Of course, also in the National Park. And there is a lot of signs when you go hiking, like this is you're approaching the bear's area, you should be careful, you're going in on your own responsibility. And when wandering around the forest, they know that they have to make lots of sounds, so they know they have to walk because to make, to make the bear you can hear them, that they are present in a bear habitat. So as I said, the bears, the bears, they're sharp animals and they will sense the presence of humans way before than then we know the bears that are here. So when you ever see the bear, you can just make a few steps back and let the bear go in its own way. The bear will only attack humans if he feels threatened or if he wants to protect the cats. In many other ways, the bear will just retreat, the bear will go in its own way, but many people here, they are really scared of bears. You, as, if you want to ask, if you ask me, they shouldn't be afraid of bears. Bears are shy, shy and much really, I really love bears. I know they don't hurt people unless you provoke them, or unless, let's say, some people, when they see a bear, they, they, uh, they may use rocks or anything nearby to show the bears. That's a mistake. 
it's only for war. A bear. When that, the bear may attack you and you can get hurt. Also, the bear, the bear may, 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 may take a block charge on you, but you never know if, whether it's a block charge or the bear is going to hurt you. So what you can do, you can just lay down, you can cover your neck, you can cover your face and just lay in bed. Do not make any sounds and the bear will eventually leave. Just do not make any sudden movements or make sounds and the bear will just increase potentially after you are made that. Thank you. And as we're getting up uh, to the end of this presentation, I just wanted to share that on September 24th, we are organizing a presentation and panel discussion on urban trees, waste cleanup, and waste management and landfills. And we'll have folks from Indonesia, India, and our very own US Forest Service to talk about phytoremediation and to answer questions like, you know, can we ever really get rid of our landfills? Can we ever lower and lessen the trash? Is it too late? To things that are more optimistic, what can we do in terms of our own behaviors to mitigate or to head off some of these um, challenges? So join us then, and we'll send out an invitation. And I wanted to thank Emir for joining us and uh, for giving this awesome presentation. It will be up on our YouTube channel um, tomorrow. And it is currently streaming um, live on Facebook, so you can go back to the Beyond Trees Network and watch it again. So thank you, Emir. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Happy Friday, and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you all for joining and see you. Bye-bye. Next week.